Can everybody hear me? I want to start this morning by talking about what scares us. I'll tell you what scares me. I'm scared of sharks. I'm scared of flying. I really hate it when people put contact lenses in their eyes next to me. You know, the world can be a, a really scary place. There's a lot that can keep any of us awake late at night. And I'm sure if you're honest, you'd say the same. But I don't need to be honest this morning because I've got the statistics to prove it. According to Mori, 77% of us think that the world is moving just too fast. A quarter of us in Britain are actually just plain unhappy with our lives. And only one in five of us think that we're going to pass on a better world to our children. We are more miserable in Britain than the Americans, the Swedish, the Brazilians, the Canadians, even the French. You can console yourself with the knowledge that we're not quite as depressed as the Russians or the Spanish, where over 40% of people are unhappy with life. Now, the research also tells us that one of the things that makes people happy is a sense of control, a sense of power over what's happening to them. So why does life feel for so many of us like it's out of control here in Britain? Look at the great movements of the 20th century. They were all about taking back power, whether it was feminism, whether it was ending discrimination, the great equality movements, they were all about taking back power over the world. The problem today is it's just not really clear who or what we need to take back control over. See, you look at the energy companies, you look at energy prices, and you think, right, let's take them on. Let's, let, let's sort that out. But then you look at what's going on in the Ukraine, and suddenly it just takes on a whole new complicated dimension that involves Putin and the EU, and also the energy bills of pensioners in Walthamstow, and it's really hard to know where to start. Or, you know, one minute you're worrying about all the forecasts about corporate greed, and you're thinking, right, we need to take these people on. But then the forecasts are that a third of jobs are going to be made by automation. Um, you know, how are we going to replace them? How are we going to make sure people still have work? You know, what are we going to do with all those taxi drivers, not just with Uber, but if we have robot-driven cars? <laughs> Previous generations have faced bigger enemies than we have, but they were slow-moving targets. It was visible poverty. It was prejudicial laws. It was open discrimination. But for our generation, all those targets keep changing. You know, is it authoritarian governments? Is it big business? Is it uneducated prejudice? Is it educated prejudice? Is it all of them? Now, at this point, you're going to be thinking, well, look, love, that's your job. That's what we elect people like you to do. Typical politician, at election time, making all sorts of promises and coming around afterwards and saying, oh, it's all a bit difficult, all a bit complicated. Or you may be thinking, oh, well, I know who really runs the show. I get it. If you want to spend a really enjoyable Sunday afternoon, far bit from me suggests that this is not one, just uh, put Illuminati into Google. Just have a look at some of the conspiracy theories that are out there. My personal favourite is that Elvis is still running a bakery in West Bromwich. I'm going to let you into a secret, though. There is no conspiracy. Nobody is really in control. You know, if Ebola really is spreading around the world, we haven't got a single way of stopping it. Or bird flu, or SARS. There really isn't a simple way to end the violence and injustice, whether it's in Gaza, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, Burma. Because with or without oil or religion or dictators, none of the participants in that have a master plan or know how to compromise with each other, or frankly, even a way to begin to write one. You know, you speak to any corporate CEO and you won't find some master of the universe. You'll find a fairly ordinary bloke and it is still all mainly men, struggling to keep up with the world around them. Talk to the most well-respected academics and policy wonks, and the ones who you will respect are the ones who admit how little we really know about the world and the world to come, and how difficult it is to see change. And you know what? That's really scary. And sometimes we can all get caught in the headlights, waiting for somebody else to take charge. But you see, the thing is, in a world this complex and erratic, no one person or institution can take charge. So for me, the idea that all you need are 650 really good MPs to sort all this out, well, it just doesn't seem to make sense of the world that we're in or the changes that we need to make. And frankly, if we all sit around waiting for somebody else to take charge, well, then the problems that we're thinking about will already have mutated into something else and we'll miss all those opportunities. And all the potential that exists to change things will be wasted as well. 
And that's why my job today, and why I think this conference is really important, is to convince you that impatience is a virtue. That the challenge for our generation, and when I say our generation, I don't mean a particular age group, I mean all of us living in this world now, is to be impatient for change. Because the decisions that we make now won't just affect our parents' generations, but our children's generations and our children's children's generations. And the one thing that we can see when we look at this complicated, difficult world around us is whether it is climate change or terrorism or enduring social immobility, the institutions and ways of working that we currently have would struggle to deal with any one of these challenges, let alone all of them together. But you see, here's the great thing about the modern world too. The modern world is capable of changing and evolving in ways that previous generations wouldn't even have dreamed of. We've halved global poverty in the last couple of decades. A cure for cancer is within our grasp. So the choice that we face as a generation now is to be impatient for that change, is to provoke it for the good of all, is to think how we can make it happen quicker and faster and further. See, the answer lies in becoming a generation that ensures each of us, whether it's individuals, communities, or countries, has the tools and the capacity to unlock the potential for achieving change that exists within all of us. And that means for people in my job, it isn't about having all the answers, but having a way of getting people to work together to find those answers, to be able to unlock the talent that exists within us, to stop trying to control the outcomes and start asking where are the gaps between people's ability to be part of that future and people who don't have that capacity? Where do we need to get resources to, to help people realize their own capacity? Now that's a new way to work, but it's a challenge that every single generation has talked about. You know, one of my predecessors as a Walthamstow MP was Clem Attlee, and the 1948 manifesto talked about being efficient with public resources. But what we have to do is find our own way for this generation to realize how to work together. Because whatever party you support, or whether you support no political party, we're all going to have to go back to the drawing board if we want to be able to be successful in the world that's to come, if we want to be able to deal with that complexity, if we want to be able to make sure we don't miss out on talent. Just think of one of the great 20th century rebels. This was a man who failed at school for whom traditional forms of work didn't work, he couldn't keep up with the skill set, whom we wouldn't give a visa to stay in the UK, so we sent him back to America. Now, who here doesn't think that Einstein changed the world in which we live in today? And who doesn't want to change the world to make sure we don't miss out on another Einstein? Because they're out there, they're part of our society. Hastening the future that our world could have requires recognizing how we support and nurture each other to achievement. Now, you might think that sounds idealistic. For me, it's ideological. I do this job because of the people in my community who I see the power and the potential within them. You know, Walthamstow's done some pretty amazing things for you that you may not realize. We've given you two-ply loo roll. We've given you Durex, and we've given you the iPad, and Brian Harvey. So however you choose to entertain yourself this evening when you leave this conference, <laughs> Walthamstow's been part of making your life a fun place to live. But that's the thing for me, you see, Walthamstow's full of talent. It just hasn't always had the pathways to succeed. And you know what? Britain is quite like Walthamstow. It's got the same inequalities, that same wasted potential. So the thing for me is how do we make that happen? Because the only thing that scares me, the only thing that keeps me awake at night is when people give up, is when people become powerless. Because powerlessness is self-fulfilling. And that's what Einstein teaches us too. Einstein said the world isn't a scary place because there are evil people in it. He said the world is a scary place because there aren't people prepared to do something about it. So here's the thing. The world isn't ready and waiting. The world is already ready and changing. But how it changes, who benefits from that, what we achieve together as a result of it, well, that's up to you. Thank you.